<clears throat> yep. Good morning, everyone. Get my monitors ready. Falling out of my ears here. All right, I think I'm ready. Father, all of my days I'll be singing your praise because you have redeemed me by giving your son my freedom's been won and you will be loving me throughout all eternity and I will be loving you for who you are and what you do when I am afraid I know you'll protect me For the prayer I've made I know you have heard But I am alone I know you are with me Faithful and true I rest in your word Oh, you are my father All of my days I'll be praying your ways because you love me when you gave up your son whose work is all done and you will be loving me throughout all eternity and I will be loving you for who you are and what you do when I am afraid I know you'll protect me for the prayer I made, I know you have heard. When I am alone, I know you are with me. Faithful, true, I rest in your word. Oh, you are my father. All of my days I sing in your praise because you have a team. By giving your son my freedom's been won And you will be loving me throughout all eternity And I will be loving you for who you are and what you do Oh, you are my father, oh yes you are You're my father, oh you are You're my father Thank you, Lord, for loving me. I love you with all of my heart. All right, I'm going to sing one more for you. Let me tell you one I love, he's here inside me, he came from up above, he is my best friend, I fell in love with him, he's my hero, he's wiped away my sin, up on the cross, he suffered, died to set me free, no one else has ever done so much for me Jesus Christ He's my hero and He's my best friend He'll be with me right down to the very end He's my hero and He's my best friend my future and he knows my past the one and only the very first and last his words are spirit and his words are life his word is power it can 
cuts me like a knife I am a slave to the one who purchased me My Lord, my God, you're deeper than the bluest sea Jesus Christ, he's my hero and he's my best friend down to the very end He's my hero and he's my best friend Who is your hero? Do you want a friend? Someone to love you? Stick with you to the end Believe in him And all those tears will be wiped away Believe in him And listen to him every day and Jesus Christ He's my hero And he's my best friend He'll be with me right down To the very He's my hero and he's my best friend He's my hero and he's my best friend He's my hero and he's my best friend Alrighty, uh, good morning to, again to all of you. Could you turn your Bibles to um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, and we, uh, so we've knocked off the eight-hour uh, eight introduction and to this uh, epistle, and then um, we looked at uh, verses 1 and 2, where in verse 1 we saw that uh, uh, we uh, noted that Paul is the author of this epistle, he identifies himself in verse 1 as the author of this epistle, and then as we pointed out, uh, not only was he addressing the uh, the recipients of this letter were not only the Ephesian Christian community, but also the various Christian communities throughout the Roman province of Asia. We noted that because this is a circular letter, as we noted in our introduction, which is indicated by the fact that there's no personal greetings in this letter, which we would expect personal greetings because he spent, Paul did, three years in Ephesus, according to Acts 18, 19, and 20. Also, we know that uh, the best and earliest manuscripts don't have the prepositional, uh, the word Ephesus there. Uh, it's, it was, uh, some say, like uh, Martian saw, the one of the ancients, Martian saw that uh, there was uh, a letter identical to this letter that were, that's called Ephesians that was addressed to the Laodiceans. So the best manuscripts and oldest manuscripts that uh, don't have that uh, phrase, the prepositional phrase in Ephesus. So it was a circular letter addressed to the various Christian communities throughout the Roman province of Asia. And uh, so then we noted the greeting. Uh, of the uh, particular of this letter in verse two, where Paul, uh, it's actually a spirit-inspired uh, uh, greeting. It's something that he prayed to the Father on behalf of the recipients of this letter. Uh, and uh, as we pointed out, 
because we left off with it, he wanted uh, the grace, which result, God's grace, which results in peace in and among believers as individuals and as, when they interact with each other. He wanted the grace of God in the form of the Spirit-inspired contents of this letter uh, to manifest itself uh, and uh, among the recipients of this letter. In other words, he wanted the Father, he, father was pray, he was praying to the Father that, uh, that uh, this uh, Spirit-inspired contents of this letter, which is in the grace of God, really, uh, as uh, would be manifested as they apply, uh, manifested among in and among the believers, that people who are re- receiving this letter, that it would be manifested in their lives, in their interactions with each other. Which, and we know the purpose of the letter was that uh, Paul wanted the unity of the church to be maintained through the practice of the command to love one another. So, uh, great uh, Spirit-inspired um, greeting that we have in verse 2. And so now, today, we're going to be looking, begin to note the preface of the letter, which is actually in the form of a doxology, which is contained in verses uh, 3 through 14. And a uh, tremendous piece of, liter- uh, piece of uh, um, literature, a uh, tremendous piece of, in this, uh, one of the several long sentences, sentences in this letter. And the preface is uh, really an introduction to, it's the beginning of the body of the letter, and it's uh, really the introduction to uh, what Paul's going to talk about in great detail throughout the rest of the letter. And uh, uh, so, um, the, uh, and what's interesting too is his first intercessory prayer uh, is uh, in verses 15 through 23 of this chapter is actually the direct result, is the reason why he intercedes in prayer for uh, the recipients of this letter. In fact, basically, the contents of verses 3 through 14 prompts Paul to pray for the recipients of this letter in verses 15 through 23, as we'll see. So this this uh, this verses three to fourteen is a we we would look at it if you look at the Greek if uh, you would see that it's uh, it's like it, it, to if we translated it as it is in Greek it'd be one long run on sentence which makes not for good English so it's always a challenge for translators to uh, translate this particular um, uh, section of the letters which is as if as you'll as we'll look at the modern translations how they translate it this preface. They do a great job. I mean, it's like, I mean, they're great translators. And so I'll give you my translation of verses 3 through 14 as well. So great. Uh, so now today, we're just going to look at the, the preface of the letter in general, look at the big picture here, you know, like kind of like the forest. And then we'll look at the individual trees in the forest, i.e. I, looking at the various the different individual verses in ver- verses 3 through 14, look at them in detail. So, uh, but today I want to look at the big picture, the, 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 the forest before we look at the trees. So uh, that's uh, what we'll be doing today, and um, so hope you all all, do, all doing well. And uh, let's take that uh, as as our custom. Here we take a moment of silent prayer. I do this when I'm at Doctrine Bible Church here in Huntsville, Alabama. And if, by the way, if you're or in in the area tomorrow at uh, 9:30 a.m., we have uh, uh, our service, and uh, we actually have two sessions, two hour long sessions uh, that I teach, and we have a break in between. And uh, if you're in the area, we're at 1215 Russell Street Northeast in Huntsville, Alabama, called Doctrinal Bible Church. And uh, so it's right, it's like a half mile down the road from me. So um, if you're in the area, come on down. So let's, uh, let's uh, take a moment of silent prayers. This is a custom, and as I said, we do this at DVC. We take a, a moment of silent prayer to uh, confess our sins if necessary, because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God, the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. And we maintain that fellowship by obeying the Holy Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5, 18, to be filled with the Spirit, and Colossians 3, 16, to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our, that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to study your word. We thank you, everyone, that's joining us live 
uh, through uh, our streaming video through YouTube. We thank for the service that they provide. Thank you for those who might be viewing or listening to these classes uh, through our various websites, podcasts, and media platforms that you've given to us at a later date. I also thank you, Father, for the technology and, again, the people taking advantage of it. And, Father, I thank you for uh, this, uh, your faithfulness to this ministry, Western Bible Ministries, and I just thank you for those who have been supporting this ministry uh, financially and praying for this ministry and through the years serving in this ministry. And I just thank you for each and every person. And uh, I also thank you, Father, for uh, electing us and predestinating us to be conformed to the image of your Son in eternity past. And also, I thank you for the personal work of your Son at the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives from regeneration to resurrection. I thank you for this study in Ephesians, and I just pray you would bless us in this study of Ephesians in particular. Uh, Paul's doxology here in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. I pray that uh, you would help me tonight, today to do a great job, uh, not only in today's service, but throughout this series. Help me to, to communicate your full counsel to your people with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power, so that your people can uh, receive the necessary, necessary spiritual nourishment. And we know that man does not live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I pray that you would help your children in the audience to be humble and sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction by the Spirit. Help them to understand, learn, enjoy, and apply correctly what they're being taught. And uh, I just pray, Father, you would break down any barriers that sin and Satan would put up that would hinder that from happening. I also pray that uh, there will be uh, no problems with recording the video and the audio and uploading these things to our various websites, podcasts, and media platforms that you've given to us, Father. So, Father, we pray for this service in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. If you haven't turned there already, please go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. As I said before the opening prayer, we'll be noting the preface, begin to note the preface of this epistle, and uh, this will constitute our 12th hour in this letter, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which is actually, as I pointed out, a letter that he wrote to all the various Christian communities throughout the Roman province of Asia, not just the Ephesian Christian community. And he wrote this under house arrest in, uh, in, in, um, in Rome, winning his appeal before Caesar between 60 and 62 AD, as we pointed out. And uh, so uh, Paul is uh, writing this letter, and uh, it's a circular letter, as I said before. And so um, today, as I said before the opening prayer as well, we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 14 in general, uh, kind of like looking at the forest before we look at the individual trees, and i.e. the individual trees are the individual verses in verses 3 through 14. So um, today we'll look at the big picture, and so I'll be reading uh, you know, the Net Bible and NIV and probably ESV translation of these verses. That's a good cross-section of uh, different appro uh, translation approaches, as well as my own. And, uh, and then I'm going to bring out some things about this particular uh, epistle that uh, I think you'll find interesting. It's actually, as I said before, a doxology, a praise of the Father for not only His work in eternity past, but for the work of the Son at the cross and, and the work of the Holy Spirit as well at justification. So uh, that's what we'll be doing here today. So uh, so if I, if I uh, may, let's, look, let's read from the Net Bible. I have it in my notes. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse... Um, let's look at verse uh, 1 in Ephesians, verses 1, uh, Ephesians 1, 1 in the Net Bible, and I'll read all the way to verse 14. So it says in Ephesians 1, 1, from Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. For he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight. In love, he did this by predestinating us to adoption as his son, through Jesus Christ, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace that he has freely bestowed on us in his dearly loved son. In him, we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He did this when he revealed to us the secret of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ toward the administration of the fullness of the times to head up all things in Christ, the things in heaven and the things on earth. In Christ, we too have been claimed as God's own possession since we were predestined according to the one purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ would be to the praise of his glory. And when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed in Christ, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, who is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession 
to the praise of his glory. If I may, let's look at the, the ESV, but let's start, we'll just read verses 3 to 14 in the ESV. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who are the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his, of his glory. So uh, we see here, that Ephesians 1, 3 marks a transition in this epistle from the introduction to the preface of the letter in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, which marks the beginning of the body of the letter. Now, this preface begins the first major section of the letter, which ends in Ephesians 3, 21, and addresses the unity of the church positionally. So, as we pointed out in our introduction, uh, this letter is structurally really easy to outline, uh, we see that we have the indicatives of the Christian faith in the first three chapters, and then we have the pro, the imperatives in the last three chapters, which is giving us, the last three chapters are giving us the application of the indicatives, of what's being taught in the first three chapters. And so Ephesians 1.3 is marking the beginning of the body of the letter. It's the preface of the letter. It marks the body of the letter. And, uh, and so, and also marks the first major sections also simultaneously of the letter. And this first major section ends at Ephesians 3.21, which again addresses the unity of the church positionally. And the last three chapters uh, are, are addressing the unity of the church experientially, which is the purpose of this letter. The first three chapters of chapter, first three verses of chapter three make that clear that Paul uh, wanted the church to maintain its unity experientially through the practice of the command to love one another, which is, uh, which is actually um, uh, in its various manifestations, this command to uh, love one another. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, actually presents three reasons why God is worthy of praise. The first reason is that the Father elected the church age believer in eternity past to be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. So the first reason is given in verses 3 through 6. Look at the NIV. It says in verses 3 through 6, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For He, that's the Father, chose us in Him, Christ, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love He predestined us, the Father did, for adoption to a sonship through Jesus Christ, through faith in Him, and our union identification with him, as we'll see, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So then we have the second reason why the Father is worthy of praise given to us in verses 7 through 12. And, uh, and that second reason is that the Son redeemed them at the cross. Look at verse 7 now. In him. We have the redemption in Christ. We have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of his sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, the millennial reign, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And him, Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And the third reason why the Father is worthy of praise is given to us in verses 13 and 14, which is namely that the Holy Spirit sealed the church age believer at their justification. So look at verse 13 now.
and I'm reading again from the NIV, you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him, Christ, with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who, the promised Holy Spirit, is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption, the rewards for faithful service, and the, until the redemption of those who are God's own possession, which is actually, speaking of the resurrection body, that'll be the completion of our redemption. And this is all to the praise of his glory. So notice, as I pointed this out in the introduction, if you look at the end of verse 6, or the beginning of verse 6, remember verses 4 and 5 uh, give us reason, verses 3, 4, and 5, give us reason why the Father is worthy of praise. Namely, he elected and predestinated us to, be, to adoption as sons through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is to the praise of his glorious grace. At the end of and, and at the at the end of verse twelve, which it ends the dis- verses seven and twelve through seven through twelve, actually, as we pointed out, contain a discussion of the third reason why the Father is worthy of praise, namely for the work of Jesus Christ at the cross and in redeeming us. And at the end of verse twelve, he says, at the end of this, this uh, presenting the reason why Christ is one of the reasons his work at the cross is one of the reasons why the Father should be worthy of praise is worthy of praise is that this would be for the praise of his glory, the Father's glories, glory. And then in verse 14, which completes a discussion about the reason why the Holy Spirit is uh, a reason for us to, in the work of the Holy Spirit, our justification, is another reason why the Father's worthy of, of our praise. It, and he says in verse 14 at the end, to the praise of the Father's glory. So the Father's glory, the manifestation of his divine nature and character, is manifested not only in, 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 through the work of the Holy Spirit, at our justification, but through the work of Jesus Christ at the cross and also through the work of the Father and eternity past, which manifests itself, this work, at our justification when we trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior because that justification through faith in Jesus manifested the fact that the church-age believer was elected by, prede- by the Father predestinating the church-age believer to adoption as sons, or in other words, to be conformed to the image of his Son. So that's the, the, the so you can see the, 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 there's three reasons here in verses 3 through 14 why the Father's worthy of praise. And it's the work of the Father in eternity past, the work of the Son in time at the cross, and the work of the Holy Spirit at our justification. So therefore, we can see that this preface not only praises the Father for his plan in eternity past to conform the church age believer into the image of his Son, but it also mentions the work of both the Son and the Spirit who executed that plan. Now, Matt, if I may, let me read my translation of verses 3 through 14 for you. Because I worked really, really hard on it. <laughs> and uh, it, I think it's, it's, it's so, uh, just a little interjection. Uh, all tra- and I mentioned this before in the past, all translations, including the ones we just read, NIV, ESV, Net Bible, all translations, including King James, all of them, they all, in any type of tra- translation, whether from, in whatever language we're going to, the, whether it's the receptor language is uh, English or, uh, or some other language, okay, um, the, um, the, there's always interpretation involved. So mine, though, is m- more interpretive, as you'll see, and I pointed this out with my translations in the past because I'm your interpreter. So uh, if I was on one of these committees, committees, obviously I wouldn't be translating the way I do. But because this is reflecting my teaching, this translation, uh, I uh, give you the translation. And I explain my translations um, when I'm teaching and also in great exhaustive detail when I give you in written form in a PDF format my exegesis and exposition of each of these books that I do. So I have an explanation. I explain the present tenses, the syntax, all that stuff. So if you're really looking to know why, you know, uh, why I translate what I do, uh, that, uh, and this will help you understand how the modern translations also translate as well. So let's look at my translation of verses 3 through 14 with that introduction to my translation out of the way. The God, namely the Father of, all, of the Lord ruling over us, who is Jesus Christ, is worthy of praise. Namely, because he is the one who has blessed each and every one of us by means of each and every kind of spirit-appropriated blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Then in verse 4 he says, For he chose us, He chose each and every one of us for his own purpose because of him alone before creation in order that each and every one of us, each and every one of us would be holy as well as uncensurable in his judgment. Verse five, he did this by predestinating us 
each and every one of us for the purpose of adoption as his sons because of his love through Jesus Christ for himself according to the pleasure of his will. This was for the purpose of praising his glorious grace, which he freely bestowed on each and every one of us because of the one who is divinely loved, Christ. Then it says in verse 7, it says, because of whom, Christ, each one of us are experiencing that which is the redemption through his blood, namely the forgiveness of our transgressions according to his infinite grace. This he, excuse me, I'm just trying to highlight it as I go along, so forgive me for uh, uh, screwing up there. So verse 8, it says, this he provided in abundance for the benefit of each and every one of us because of the exercise of a wisdom which is absolute and divine in nature, resulting in the manifestation of an insight which is absolute and divine in nature. He did this by revealing the mystery of his will for the benefit of each and every one of us according to his pleasure, which he planned beforehand because of our faith in and union identification with himself. This was for the dispensation which brings to completion the various periods of history, namely to unite for the benefit of himself each and every animate and inanimate, inanimate object in the sphere of the sovereign authority of the person of the one and only Christ. Specifically, to unite for the benefit of himself those things in the heavens as well as those things on the earth in the sphere of the sovereign authority of himself, because of whom he, each and every one of us has been claimed as a possession because of having been predestinated according to the predetermined plan, namely the one who is causing each and every animate and inanimate object to function according to his purpose, that is, his sovereign will, in order that each and every one of us would belong to a particular group of people, namely, those who were certain of possessing a confident expectation of blessing because of their faith in and union and identification with the one and only Christ for the purpose of praising his glory. Verse 13, correspondingly, because of whom, Christ, each and every one of you were sealed by means of the omnipotence of the one and only promised spirit who is holy because each and every one of you obeyed the one and only message, which is truth, namely the proclamation of the one and only gospel, which produced your salvation, specifically because each and one of you believed in him. The spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until he redeems his possession for the praise of his glory. So that's my translation of verses 3 through 14. Stumbled a little bit there reading them because I'm trying, I was trying to highlight it for you, each individual verses, but sometimes... Um, I have a little difficulty doing that with the mouse, so um, uh, you'd think I would be good, pretty good at that by now, but sometimes I can blame it on the program. I knew a guy used to do that, <laughs> but I couldn't do that. This is operator error, as we used to call it. I used to work in a tech place, uh, you know, not that I'm a high-tech guy, but as I, I used to work in the solving uh, problems with uh, people with their computers and stuff and programs, and we'd always just have to say in the, in the help desk, uh, operator error. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Harold Honer, who is a, who's done a number of commentaries on this book of Ephesians. He's, one of the, he's passed away not too long ago, but he's done a lot of stuff. He, he was a, he's one of the great interpreters of the, I believe, of the of this past uh, 100 years. He, he, fantastic uh, scholar, and uh, I would have loved to meet him. Now I'm going to have to wait till I go home to be with the Lord or the rapture so I can meet him. But he's interesting guy he was one of those guys i wanted you know i've always wanted to go to uh dallas theological seminary oh for, well, for about 35 years now and uh he you know a lot of the old timers like wolverd and uh pentecost i wanted to meet and stuff like that and of course now when harold honer was one of these these guys and dan wallace of course and uh but uh and there's others there and a lot of and some other younger guys are actually really good there too that i've actually listened sat in on through um the uh, podcast uh, or on iTunes watched some of these classes in fact it was uh, like Michael Spiegel he's excellent and um, uh, some other guys there um, Kreider he's a great he's, he's an excellent teacher too so they had a lot of good people there still and uh, but uh, I've always wanted so Harold Horn was one of those guys at Dallas that I always wanted to to meet. But anyways we'll have to wait that's going to have to wait so Harold Horner has a good comment on Ephesians and he's one of the great scholars, uh, you know, expositors on Ephesians, actually. So uh, one of the experts on it. So Harold Horner has the following quote. He says, in the Greek text, verses 3 through 14 are one long sentence of 202 words, considered by one scholar to be the most monstrous sentence in the Greek language. And uh, he says, this is the first of, it's pretty funny, this is the first of eight lengthy sentences in the book. He says, this one, verses 3 through 14, 15 through 23 of chapter 1, 
Ephesians 2, 1 through 7, Ephesians 3, 2 through 13, Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, Ephesians 6, 14 through 20. And he says three of these, verses 3 through 14 and 15 through 23 of chapter 1 and Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, are praise and prayer for which it is not unusual to have lengthy sentences. Even in present times, it's not uncommon in extemporaneous praise and prayer to have long, complicated sentences with so many subordinate clauses and phrases. In the last hundred years, there has been much discussion on the form and structure of this passage. In the final analysis, he says, in the final analysis, it appears that verses 3 through 14 is a eulogy, literally a well-speaking of, not reserved just for funerals. So he says in the final analysis, Verses 3 through 14 is a eulogy whose style accords with other Jewish Hellenistic eulogies. But its content, he says, goes beyond them. And then he says, in the abundance of descriptive words in this long, complicated sentence regarding God's purpose, plan, and action, there's form and development of thought. The form is demonstrated by the frame, uh, refrain, praise and glory to God. Verse two, uh, Ephesians 1.12, see also, he says, Ephesians 1, six and 14, which we read. So he says, the form is demonstrated by the refrain, praise and glory to God, which is given after mentioning each person of the Trinity in the order of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as I just mentioned to you. Then he says, in closing, the development is demonstrated by the progression from a pronouncement of praise to God, verse 3, to a description of God's great plan and action in verses 4 through 12, and finally to its application to the believers in verses 13 through 14. This eulogy is a very fitting introduction to the letter as a whole, and amen to that, to that, <laughs> to that, to that. <laughs> it's not like a guy from the hood, huh? <laughs> All right, let's look at, look at the Net Bible has an interesting quote, and it's not as long in verses 3, 4, uh, they say in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, they say these verses comprise one long sentence in Greek with three major sections. Each section ends with a note of praise for God, verses 6, 12, and 14, as I pointed out to you. And they say, if they focus on a different member of the Trinity, as I also pointed out to you. Then they say, after an opening summary of all the saints' spiritual blessings in verse 3, the first section, verses 4 through 6, offer a praise that the Father has chosen us in eternity past. The second section, verses 7 through 12, offers up the praise, up, up praise to the, that the Son has redeemed us in the historical past at the cross. And the third section, verses 13 and 14, offers up praise that the Holy Spirit has sealed us in our personal past at the point of conversion. And to quote, great quote from the, the Bible. So the contents of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 contain what we call a triadic pattern. So for those of you who have studied the Trinity with me, we just, uh, one of my, on Wednesday nights, I, I with a doctoral Bible church here in Huntsville, um, I have two sessions, as I say, on Sunday, uh, starting 9.30, and they're hour-long sessions. By the time we get out of there, it's around noon. But, um, and on Wednesday, and so on Sundays, I do b different books of the Bible. So right now, we've done Jude, we're on Obadiah, we're getting near the end of that. And uh, then we're going to, uh, and on Wednesdays, I've been doing different doctrinal subjects of the Christian faith. So I do the books on the sun on Sunday with them, and different uh, doctrinal subjects uh in, uh, on Wednesday classes. So the first one I did was the Trinity. We finished off canonicity not too long ago. We're on inspiration. So uh, and so I've, I've done these all these subjects at with Western Bible Ministries throughout the last Western Bible Ministries over the last twenty five years or whatever thirty years. So one of those subjects is the Trinity. And so the Trinity we pointed out the triadic patterns that are in the New Testament in Ephesians one three through fourteen has one of those triadic patterns. So the contents again of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, contain a triadic patterns since, as we noted, these verses describe the Father's work in electing the, the church age believer in eternity past, verses 3 through 6, and the work of the Son in redeeming the church age believer at the cross, verses 7 through 12, and also the work of the Holy Spirit in sealing them at their justification. That's in verses 3, 13 through 14, as we pointed out. Ralph Martin, another expositor on the book of uh, Ephesians, uh, he says the following, he says, and I'm quoting, it is the Father who chooses his people in love, verses 3 through 5. The one in whom the church is elected is Christ the Son, who is also the Redeemer at the cost of his sacrificial death, verse 7. Then he says, Martin says, it is the Holy Spirit who applies the work of Christ to his people and so makes real in human experience the eternal purposes of the Trinity, verses 13 to four and 14. Then Martin says, according to this view, the text is laying the foundation on which later creeds and liturgies will be formed. 
out of these raw materials will be fashioned the Christian belief in and confession of one God and three persons. This may be so, yet the present passage is still a long way from a set of creedal statement, and it shares more in the exultant outbursts of praise that go back to the enthusiasm and charismatic freedom that characterized the Pauline congregations. So uh, we see here, just to, to jump off uh, and to um, you know, tease out the, uh, what being said by Martin there and the others, uh, is uh, that um, you know, the, the, the Father had a plan in eternity past, electing and predestinating us. And uh, of course he did that in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. So he sends his son to the cross, his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session of the right hand of the Father uh, accomplished the Father's plan to, of salvation, to save sinners. And, uh, and so that crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, session of Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father, it uh, delivered the, uh, the, all of sinful humanity out of the slave market of sin, in which they were all born physically alive, yet spiritually dead. It delivered them from enslavement to sin and Satan and his cosmic system, so therefore, uh, and that as well. It also delivered uh, those things, and those events in Jesus' life, also delivered us from spiritual and physical death, condemnation from the law, personal sins. And also, of course, not uh, last but not least, eternal condemnation. And so when the sinner trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior, the Father at that moment declares them uh, justified. And so to, to declare them justified, they must believe that Jesus is both uh, the, uh, uh, as their Savior. And in other words, you have to believe he's both God and man and he rose from the dead. And I'll have to explain, because there are many Jesus out there that people talk to you, talk to you about, but which Jesus are we talking about? Well, it's the Jesus of the gospel. So Jesus is both God and man. If you don't believe that he's God and both God and man, then you don't have a mediator with God. A sin is you know, a mediator with a holy God, and Jesus is both God and man. If he's, the Gnostics said he wasn't a man, so therefore that's not they, they couldn't get saved because they didn't believe he was a human being. And then... Uh, we see that uh, that you have to believe he rose from the dead because his death is meaningless. He's just another dead human being who thought he was something that he was not. And uh, but uh, because his resurrection demonstrates that the Father has vindicated him and has uh, accepted the work of his Son on the cross on our behalf and suffering the wrath of God in our place. So Jesus lived the life that we a perfect obedience that we couldn't live because we're sinners by nature and practice. He suffered the wrath of God in our place so that we wouldn't suffer the wrath of God in the lake of fire forever. So therefore, when the sinner trusts in Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, based upon the merits of the object of their faith, his son Jesus Christ, the Father, declares the sinner justified. That means you now have eternal security. You're saved. It's a one-shot decision. And uh, you can't, uh, he, God is a perfect judge. He can't rescind the decision because of any action that you commit after your justification, including murder. Example, uh, King David committed murder as a believer, yet he's in heaven. Moses committed murder as a believer, and he's in heaven. Uh, they're, they're, uh, Saul was attempting to murder people, uh, but uh, like David, and uh, so uh, yet he's in heaven, and so that they got saved not based upon their own merits, but on the merits of the object of their faith. So, what sin could you co possibly commit after your justification that could cause you to lose your salvation? He remains faithful even though we're unfaithful at times, right? Like Peter, uh, Timothy, uh, Paul said to Timothy. So that doesn't mean you're not going to, so if you decide you're not going to do God's will and you're, and you're going to live a lifestyle of not doing God's will, well, you'll be disciplined by God and he'll do it from his attribute of love. So nobody's, everybody's held accountable for their behavior, including believers. Now, at the moment of that justification, the Holy Spirit appropriated the work of the Son. In, in other words, the Holy Spirit appropriates for the church, church age believer the great deliverance that Jesus provided for us through his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father. So that means the Father looks at us no longer in the first Adam, which was a place of curse and under the wrath of God, cursing and, bless, uh, and wrath. Now we're in the place of blessing because he looks at us as he looks at his son, crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with his son. Why? Because we're under his headship, we're under his uh, authority, we're, uh, we're members of his body, and uh, those events in Jesus' life provided us our so great salvation. That's why. So, the Holy Spirit appropriates the work of this of this, of this Son. So now, our job, what Paul, as, as you'll see in Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, Paul wants recipients of this letter, these Christians, to understand, possess the conviction of, regarding their 
union identification with Christ and, and the confident expectation of blessing that they receive as a result of this union identification with Christ. He wants them to possess the conviction that they, that they, they have these things, that they're their possession, so, because he wants them to appropriate by faith this union identification with his son, Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, Jesus Christ, and consider ourselves crucified, died, buried, raised, and seen with Christ to deal with temptation to sin and to grow up, to become like Jesus Christ and grow up spiritually and execute the Father's will and get rewards for faithful service at the Bema seat. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, in this, in this, so we have a Trinitarian, um, uh, uh, we have a, uh, we have a, each member of the Trinity being mentioned in this doxology that begins the book. And, uh, and it sets the stage for what's going to be taught in the rest of the book. So, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3, to 14, 3 through 14, is, uh, as I said before, contains a magnificent Pauline doxology. So, to uh, finish off the rest of the class, I want to talk about doxologies. Yeah, I, I, I've, we, talked some, we talked about them in previous books, like I think the latest one was uh, Jude, in the last couple of verses of Jude. Uh, we talked about the subject of doxology. So, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, contains a magnificent Pauline doxology. Now, what does doxology mean? Well, the term doxology, people, is from the Greek word doxologia, and it's derived from the Greek noun doxa, which means praise, glory, honor, and it denotes a brief description of praise to members of the Trinity. It would, the doxology was used in both song and prayer, and it was sung by angels to shepherds the night the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world, Luke 2.14. The doxology was commonly employed in various parts of the New Testament epistles, such in salutations, like in Galatians 1.5, and also opening thanksgiving, as we saw in Ephesians 1.3. It also uh, appears in opening thanksgivings in 1 Peter 1.3 and 2 Corinthians 1.3. It also appears in final exhortations, such as 1 Timothy 6.15 and 1 Peter 5.11 and 2 Peter 3.18. And lastly, uh, the doxology was employed in closing of letters, uh, such as in Hebrews 13.20 and as in Jude 24, as I just pointed out to you. Now, the basic formula is the blessing formula. Blessed be the Lord, blessed be the God and Father, uh, followed by a statement of the attributes motivating the utterance, primarily God's activities and the lives of his people. Variants are worthy as the Lamb, or holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, such as in Revelation 4.8. Doxologies may begin with an imperative verb, challenging the hearers to ascribe to the Lord glory and strength or the glory of his person, uh, or ascribe power, as in Psalm 68, 34, or to praise the Lord, uh, and, uh, and also uh, a glory in his holy person, as in 1 Chronicles 16, 10. Now, in doxologies, uh, the following qualities are attributed to God. Number one, glory, as in Romans 16, 27, Galatians 1, 5. Also, honor and dominion is attributed to God the Father in 1 Timothy 6.16 and 1 Peter 4.11. We also see salvation and power in Revelation 19 and 1 are attributed to the Father. Number four, majesty and authority are also attributed to the Father in Jude 25. And these are all forever, such as in Romans 11.36, or forever and ever, as we can see in 2 Timothy 4.18 and 1 Peter 5.11. Now, in the New Testament, doxologies may begin with exclamations of hallelujah, such as in Revelation 19.1, or glory to God in the highest, as in Luke 2.14, or hosanna to the son of David. And Matthew 21.9, Matthew 21.15, Mark 11.9, and John 12.13. Now, although God the Father is the primary focus of New Testament doxologies, as here in Ephesians 1.3-14, there are others that are the objects of praise, such as Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 21, 9 and Revelation 5, 12. Also, in his kingdom, uh, the, the, his kingdom and uh, his father's kingdom in Mark, Mark eleven ten. A frequent Christological doxology exclaims, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, as we can see in the Gospels, such as in Mass Matthew 21, 9, 23, 39, Luke, Mark 11, 9, Luke 19, 38. And you can compare that with Psalm 118, Verse 26, which says, May the one who comes in the name of the Lord be blessed. We will pronounce blessings on you in the Lord's temple. Now in doxologies, uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ is ascribed salvation and power, as in Revelation 19.1, so, as well as blessing and might. In Revelation 5.18, glory is attributed to him, ascribed to him in Hebrews 13.21. Dominion as well, as in Revelation 1.6, and both now and to the day of eternity. 
Uh, that's uh, in 2 Peter 3, 18. Praise is also offered up through Jesus Christ, as in Romans 16, 27, Hebrews 13, 21, and Jude 25. Or praise is offered up in Christ, such as in, as we can see in Ephesians 1, 3, and 3, 21. Really, our doxology is expressed in the second person, as blessed are you, or in yours is the greatness, power, glory, and victory, and majesty, as in 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Now, originally, doxologies were voiced by the congregation at the conclusion of hymns. We can see that in 1 Chronicles 16, 36, and Romans 11, uh, 33 through 36. It says in Romans 11, 33 and 36, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how fathomless His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor? Or who is first given to God that God needs to repay Him? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. So again, originally doxologies were voiced by the congregation at the conclusion of hymns in connection with the response, Amen. We can see that in Matthew 6.13, Revelations 1.6, and Romans 9.5, 16.27, and 1 Peter 4.11, and 1 Peter 5.11. Look at Romans chapter 16, verse 25. It says there, now, and I'm reading from the Net Bible, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that has been kept secret for long ages, but now is disclosed and through the prophetic scriptures have been made known to all the nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever. Amen. So, how, uh, again, vo originally doxologies were voiced by the congregation at the conclusion of hymns and prayers in connection with the response of Amen. However, praise and thanksgiving do occur in the opening lines of prayers, such as in 1 Chronicles 29, 10-13. We can see da this is in uh, Daniel chapter 2, verses 20-23, through and Luke chapter 1, verses 67-69. through Now, as in Jewish ritual, they may have been uttered in, the doxologies must, may have been uttered in response to the mention of God's name. Uh, this is alluded to in Romans 1, 25 and also 2 Chronicles 11, 31. Now, there's a commentator named uh, Lenski, and he has the following comment with regards to the doxology that's found in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Uh, he says the following, I'm quoting from him. He says, other epistles begin with thanksgiving. This one. 2 Corinthians and 1 Peter begin with a doxology. And the greatest of these doxologies is the one found in Ephesians. The one found in 2 Corinthians is due to the intense emotion of comfort, this one to the profound contemplation of the whole work of God for our salvation. Paul glorifies God, the fountain of our salvation. The doxology is Trinitarian. It reaches from eternity to eternity, both in contents and in structure, it towers, this one in Ephesians, this doxology in Ephesians, he says, towers above all other doxologies. It's comparable to Psalm 103, he says. So, uh, that's the end of the quote. So we can see here that Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14 is a doxology. It's a praise to the Father, one for his work on our eternity, his work on our, on our behalf as church age believers in eternity past, and electing, electing us to be uh, conformed to the image of his son and, and by predestinating us to adoption as sons. Uh, that was in verses 3 through 6. And then the second reason why the father is uh, should be worthy of praise, is worthy of praise, is the work of the son and his son Jesus Christ at the cross and redeeming us sinners out of the slave market of sin by suffering the wrath of God in our place and living a life of perfect obedience to the law that we couldn't because we're sinners by nature and practice. That work of the Son is mentioned in verses 7 through, 4, uh, 7 through 12, and the Father is worthy of praise for the work of His Son at the cross and executing His plan for salvation for us sinners. The third reason is found in verses 13 and 14, which is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives at the moment of our justification. And, uh, and that, uh, those three reasons, those are the three reasons, the work of the Son, the Spirit, and the Father in eternity past are the three reasons, major reasons why the Father is worthy of praise. So this is a praise to the Father. It's a doxology. It's, it's a preface of the letter. And uh, it has the triadic pattern where each member of the Trinity is mentioned. And, uh, and it uh, is uh, in, in maging, it's, uh, the, 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 the language 
and the, the, as Honer put, points out, it's a it's a long run on sentence, two hundred two words, and uh, but it's mag it's magnificent Greek. It's very beautiful. It's very beautiful. It's very deep, and uh, it, you know when you translate it into English, it really doesn't capture. Um, really what it's what it's saying in the Greek. It's like, to me, I wouldn't mind, I could translate the thing as a run-on sentence as it is in the Greek. And But people would read it like, you know, would would uh, have a hard time with it because we don't like run-on sentences in English. It doesn't make for good English. But I could do that. I could translate it for myself that way. Uh, but then have no problem with it because it'd be like close as, uh, you know, it would be reminding me of the Greek, you know, as close as I could get to it. But we don't translate that way. And, uh, but anyways... Um, it's it's great Greek. It's uh, it's it's a very diff It's very a challenge to interpret, and uh, and there's that prepositional phrase that you see in Christ, which is actually Paul's shorthand for many times, uh, most of the time, for the, the Christians' justification by faith in Jesus Christ, and also simultaneously at justification, our union identification with Christ. So he says in Christ, the English translations in this passage. Uh, verses three to fourteen, he's alluding to the, the the believers' justification through faith in Christ and their union identification with Christ, which took place at their justification. All right, it's Paul's shorthand, and uh, the readers would understand this, of course, because Paul would have breaks it out for them, teases it out for them, and his teaching when he's face to face with them, and also in his letters, to a certain extent. So um, we got a long. This is just the beginning, and uh, we'll be picking this up uh, on. Um, Tuesday next uh, this coming Tuesday, which is supposed to get really warm out here. It's supposed to be a record breaking, uh, maybe record breaking in the seventies here, uh, high, close to eighty. But um, what we'll see is uh, in verse uh, uh, on Tuesday we'll be seeing that the Father. We'll be looking at the first part of verse three, and the message will be the Father's worthy of praise. And then, and then we'll f look at the. Um, the B section, the second section in Ephesians 1 3, noting that the Father blessed the church age believer by means of every kind of spirit appropriated blessing. Well, that's going to be a fun class, too, because good, we'll have to go over some uh, interpretive issues there. But uh, so that's what we got coming, and this is just the beginning of a great letter. And we just begin the body, the body of the letter by noting the preface of the letter, which contains this doxology in Ephesians 1 3 through 14. We looked at the forest, so to speak, with these verses, and now we're going to look at the individual trees in the forest starting on. This coming Tuesday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. See you then, Lord willing. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson be a blessing to your people, bringing glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.